Um, we've got some interesting stuff to show you um, from both the design perspective and the engineering perspective. Um, and it's our journey of how we came um, to the latest incarnation of our design system. Um, what you'll see today may not be the best practice textbook perfect way to do it. It definitely won't be the way that you should do it. Um, but it's a way that worked for us. Um, um, it's some, some realities and in particular nine things we learned in our journey of trying to, to create and realise a design system. Um, thank you to Will who has been the laptop stand. So let's get started. Um, we're from SAGE. Um, SAGE, our mission um, is to empower businesses of all different sizes um, in many different countries uh, with software that makes their lives easier. Um, we're based here in London, um, up on the high floor of the Shard, uh, but me and Will are from Newcastle. So if you, you take a train and point it north and keep going for uh, the four hours, you'll eventually get to a really, really nice, lovely little place. Um, it's a bit of a strange place for a tech headquarters, but we are there. Um, so we come down to London sometimes, we, we head up the Shard, um, and we take a load of selfies, hashtag life at Sage, um, and uh, we look at the, the beautiful city of London um, and all the incredible things and the incredible communities that are, that are based here. Um, unfortunately, it's a little bit misleading for us because what really matters are these views. Um, and these are the views of the many different small businesses right across the country. Um, these businesses are responsible uh, for actually the majority of new jobs generated in this country and for a huge section of the economy. Um, so these are the heroes doing the work day in, day out, the hard graft in tricky situations. Um, they're the people who took the massive leap of faith to ditch the nine to five and, and start their own enterprise. They're the hobbyists who have a nine to five but do something incredible on Saturday and it's starting to take off. They're the small limited companies or the business partnerships. Um, inside these places, um, if we move to the next one, um, it's a little rough and ready, the microwave's on top of the fridge, um, but there's the world map on the wall of great ambitions of, of what these businesses could become. Um, I've been to both these businesses, um, one's out in Holland um, and one's up in the, the northeast of England, um, they do incredible things and it's our, it's our job to make life easier for them. So that's our mission and um, our opportunity um, is this. So in Sage, uh, we build things. Um, we also acquire other tech companies to join our portfolio. We also integrate um, with a lot of different software as well. So you can imagine all of the diversity and variance of UI um, and of UI UX teams coming to join us as well. Um, if we move to the next one, um, something I did to visualize this internally at Sage um, was we needed um, something of a wake up call for, for our execs to really showcase um, the problem ahead. Um, now, uh, and here we wanted to use Envision. Um, as a cool means, you can do all kinds of things with, with, with Envision. Um, but here we created a little browser, um, and what I wanted to do here is showcase our user journey, and within it, showcase some of the, the inconsistency of so These are our login screens, um, and there's many of them. Um, and they've all happened for perfectly good reasons. Um, but this is really confusing to our users. We need to sort out that inconsistency. Here's a couple of our products. Um, so for our smallest businesses, here's Sage One, looks like that. For large global enterprises, here's Sage X3, looks like that. Again, quite different, a lot of variability there. Some of it with good rationale, good logic, but not all of it. Um, and there's those acquisitions. So two recent acquisitions, Fair Sale and Intact joined the Sage family. Completely different UIs because they're completely different products, completely different teams working completely different ways. So we need something um, to bring this together to unify it. Um, it's not an easy task, um, but it's a very worthy one, one that needs doing. So let's dive back into the press. Ultimately, it came down to this. So here at Sage, um, if I look at our internal standards and I want to design a simple button, there are all these different ways of doing it, different ways um, that they look to users in different code and line as well. Um, we've got to solve that problem. But we're not alone. Um, just a little bit of data that we could find in the industry there. Um, if we ask design orgs what the challenges you face in improving and resolving consistency, 
um, is a leading, uh, leading factor there. If we ask them, uh, are you working on a design system? Do you have a design system? Many people say yes. Even more people say they're working on it. So that tells me that we're actually looking at the start of a big ramp. These things are common and, and prolific. They're about to get more so. Um, so we're definitely not alone. So our first learning at Sage internally was the realization that we actually need a design system. And as we heard in the last presentation, a clear link between design success and organizational success. So all right, got some buy-in. We need one of these things. What comes next? Um, well, something we've done before is that we realize there are lots of competing standards. And we think, well, how, how, how do we live with that? It's ridiculous. We need a, a universal standard to drive this up. The solution here is all of that is that now there are 15 competing standards. So we don't want to go around the cycle again. We don't have to create another standard. We have to do something a little different in this time. Um, looking at industry models, um, there are loads of different potential models which explain different approaches to design systems in different structures. Um, some have component libraries and code, and others are more of a style guide. Some focus more on the foundational things like color and typography and iconography. Others get into the real detail of individual types of inputs and grids and drop downs and all the props and configs. Uh, there's great diversity. Um, but one of my favorite descriptions is this one from Nathan Curtis. Uh, Nathan um, is on Medium and has some brilliant articles. And you can see his, his thinking evolving over time as you go through his articles. Um, now he said a design system is almost always um, something that includes visual style and UI components. Um, almost always released as version HTML CSS, almost always has a living web based uh, design style guide, um, and almost always made by allocated individuals or teams. Um, less common, but still quite often. Um, it includes things like content, tone of voice, accessibility, um, it includes documentation. Um, and less often, again, um, it might include a, a JavaScript framework, uh, usually React or Angular. Um, and more than just individual components, it also includes stuff on patterns, how to arrange those components into a design that makes sense. Um, so that was useful to us. Uh, there are elements from all three columns there that we wanted to, to include for our org. Um, when I think about what I now know about design systems, I think of them as much less being frameworks <coughs> of foundations and components, but much more about the people in the org. Um, so it's not a single library um, or a single standard. I think of it as a product to enable us to build products, which is more aligned to stage of mission. Um, it's a process, it's a methodology, it changes your way of thinking, uh, your ways of working, but it's also a community of connected people. So we can't build a design system without that community um, to, to design and to build it. Um, Here's the model that we eventually devised. So this is the one that's right for us. It might not be right for everybody, but it, it worked in, in our context. So at the top of the tree, we had our design principles. Um, then we had our foundations, things like color, contrast, spacing, layout, typography, iconography. Um, then we have our patterns and components. Um, but there is some variability there because we want our design system to scale across websites, the marketing sites where you can try or buy. Um, to also scale into our cloud products. And those could be um, in a web browser, could be on iOS or Android, um, and native mobile there as well. Um, so our second learning was that no design system is textbook perfect. There are lots of published models, but nothing is immaculate. Perfect theory doesn't necessarily make for perfect products. It's your tailoring skills that count. Um, so by all means, look out there at industry, but then you've got to synthesize it for your particular context. Um, ultimately, um, there are loads of design systems, loads of brilliant ones. We wanted to learn from these, build on them, um, and also contribute back as well. Um, a favourite one of mine is gov.uk. Um, I love it because of its elegance and simplicity. I love it because of its accessibility as well. And I love it because it works when I go to, to gov.uk. Um, another great uh, one is Adele. Adele is almost like a search engine of design systems. Um, so you can compare and contrast them. You can look at the components uh, and see how they're, they're rendered in different places. Um, does a design system mean making everything the same? That was a concern um, that we had from uh, some designers. 
Um, no, I don't think it does. So the design system will help to resolve that prolific inconsistency that can creep in for, for no good rationale. Um, designs should feel familiar, part of the family, um, but don't have to necessarily be identical. There's still plenty of room for creativity. Um, so on the scale there, I've got one side logical variability. And what I mean there is that you might take a component, but you might need properties or configurations to tailor it to different sorts of situations. If you imagine a table of financial data, you might present that very differently to the smaller startup as you would to a professional financial controller in a global enterprise. There's logic behind that. It's good variability, good difference. Consistency in the middle. Yeah, good staple. Need to resolve all those different login screens. But also something uh, called context-specific uniqueness. So actually, if I'm trying to improve my conversion rates, or if I've got a situation like, um, say, making tax digital uh, in the UK, or Brexit coming up, business has got to respond to that. Perhaps there's something really unique about this situation, which means I should break with standard and do something different because it's worth it and because there's rationale. That's fine too. You can choose to follow the design system, you can choose to break the design system. As long as you've got rationale for it, that's absolutely fine. Um, so that's our third learning, reassuring the, the designers who are a little nervous about that. It's a balance between consistency and that sort of variability. Um, building a team, we need a team to run this. Um, in our earliest days, that was a solitary team. So one clever person would do something cool and would share it with other people. Um, and that's, that's fat, and we want to maintain that initiative. Um, build more maturity down the line, a centralised model. So now we've got a dedicated team, that dedicated team is going to solve the problem, we're going to tell everybody else uh, what the solution is. But much better than that is a federated team. Um, so here, we're kind of wearing two hats. So all of us are going to keep working away um, on our day jobs, building solutions for users, building products, and we're going to carry that rich context into a design system team. Now that means the things we'll come up with and the solutions we'll build in that design system team will be context rich. And when we do build a design system, we can use those individuals to deliver the results back to their teams. And because it's their own idea, it takes off and embeds much, uh, uh, in a much closer way. So Nathan Curtis there said, uh, we need our best designers to work on our, working on our most important products, to work out what the system is, and spread it out to everybody else um, without quitting the day jobs. Um, and that's perhaps a good way to do it. Um, further to that, and this is a really important point, um, the design system team can't be composed solely of designers, nor solely of engineers. We need a blended team to make it work. So a perfect design team, uh, design system, still needs implementation. It's the proof of the pudding um, is in the eating when code is cut and when it's exposed to users. Um, now, for us to do that, say, which we need a little help, um, and that's where our colleagues at PGS come in. So this is actually this morning's stand-up, uh, which I, I grabbed and added to a slide. Um, so uh, we need our friends at PGS uh, to help us go faster uh, and to help us move at pace, but also to give us um, a fresh view and an independent viewpoint. Um, so they're on this before and they know what works in different situations and what doesn't work in different situations and that knowledge is, is really useful to us. Um, so that's our friendly team, I join them each morning um, and we, we, we go through our Agile daily stand-up. Um, and uh, there's prolific questions throughout the day, uh, really tough ones as well, come up with all kinds of corners that we haven't thought about uh, that makes for a stronger product. Um, so our fourth learning is don't quit the day job, federate. Um, it's fine for those designers to retain their jobs building products. It's actually better. Make sure your design system has, has context. So now I'll show you um, how the design system took place. Um, this is the result of um, some creative work we did. Um, and uh, these are the, the three layers um, that we used to explain it to our org, our foundations, our components, our patterns. Um, we put together a little booklet, um, some of which I, I dotted around. Um, and the some is on the, the right beside the door. Um, this is how we sold it um, to our executive and uh, to others in the org. So our design system is everything you need to build Sage Business Cloud experiences that people love. Um, it starts out with our design principles. Um, so at Sage, we want our products to be clear and guiding. Uh, we want them to be reassuring and trustworthy. And 
we want them to be adaptive and contextual and delightful and useful. Now it's important to hold on to those as you design. It's easy to forget them as just words, um, but we intend to use them when we take decisions and to compare and contrast rationale. Uh, but it's great to have them as the keystone of the system. Um, in some detail, um, we wanted to set a colour palette and um, we did a little research and uh, we found some suggestion that perhaps the smaller businesses and the startups anticipate and expect a brighter, lighter, more vibrant colour palette. Um, so accounting start and accounting are small uh, business products that have our green accent colour. Then there's a spectrum through blue and into deep purple, some evidence that um, products for financial controllers, um, they perhaps prefer um, a deeper, more contrastive uh, colour palette, uh, perhaps uh, emulating the, uh, the, the uh, old uh, interfaces of uh, the stock market. Um, so we decided to bring in this, uh, this colour palette, three uh, different key colours and uh, a colour spectrum. So all of the colours of all of our components and componentry derive from, from this spectrum. Um, going places with mobile, we've never had a consistent definition of breakpoints and grid before. Um, and that's the root of a whole load of inconsistency, uh, if you don't have that foundation. Um, so we used analytics uh, to define uh, what would work best for us there. Um, monitors are, are getting larger, um, as they always are, and about 50% of users are on that particular breakpoint, uh, which is a good learning. Typography, uh, there's so much in this. And this, this actually becomes really important, takes on an extra dimension when you're dealing with figures and numerals, which could decide a business's future. Um, so we wanted to um, pair um, typography. So on the one hand, we wanted some type which was unique um, and uh, felt uh, very much like Sage. On the other hand, we need something uh, which is precise, highly readable and accurate. Um, so Adele Sage is our brand font, very uh, great for uniqueness. Uh, but Open Sans is a, a monospaced font. That means your numerals line up um, along the decimal place and you don't get that raggy uh, look and feel down the edge. Um, it's also um, can be served from a, a content delivery network really quickly. So you don't get that flash of unstyled text, which can turn something which would be quite delightful and polished into something which is a little bit irritating. Um, so we put a lot of thought into, into that. Um, and then come the components. And there are loads of these uh, for all different purposes, um, the building blocks of experiences. Um, but more than that, uh, guidance on how to assemble these components um, into whole designs, the, the patterns. Um, so we didn't want to, it's a bit like the, the old joke about the, uh, the guy who goes into the bar um, and there's a terrible noise coming from the piano player. And he goes to the piano player and he says, why are you playing all the wrong notes? The piano player says, no, I'm playing all the right notes, just not necessarily in the right order. Um, that's what this is about. You can use the, our componentry set to create beautiful designs. You can also use them to create designs which aren't perhaps so beautiful at all. Um, so we need some guidance and some frameworks on how to assemble these things into to patterns too. Um, to do that, we found an interface inventory was a really useful exercise. And uh, Brad Frost has a great uh, model for this. So um, you can grab a template from his website simply start screenshotting, go through all your apps. That was actually quite fun. Uh, we did do that in the shard, uh, covered all the walls so you couldn't see the view anymore. Um, and then we started categorizing it and presented it back. Um, now that gives us a great view of the things, the components that should go into the system, but also the things we don't want to do again, the things that didn't quite work so well, or the things we wish weren't there. Um, it doesn't end with components though. And this is something I think we could have got better. Um, so um, the atoms there in the, the atomic design uh, template from Brad Frost, um, I guess, are our components. We then kind of skipped ahead. And I, I guess we went straight to organisms and how they're assembled together in what I call patterns. Um, but we didn't stop at molecules. and We didn't do templates or pages. Um, with hindsight, I think we could have done a, a better job of stepping more carefully through the different levels there. And that would have been of greater use to our, our, uh, our designers and our developers, I think. Um, so that's a good learning. First things first, components are just the start. Resist the temptation to, to skip to the end or move too fast. 
Um, selling it internally, um, well, the booklet helped us do that, and there's loads of advantages, uh, and the last presentation was a great example of that. Um, I think a key thing for me, um, being a design manager, though, is that the design system is helping us really shift resource from replicating the, uh, the same problems over and over to something much more cutting edge so we can spend time on the cool stuff. Um, if your execs like big numbers, there sure are a lot of big numbers, which might help. Um, so um, this is from uh, General Electric in the US, their design system, um, they quoted 100% productivity gains and something like 30 million in dev effort saved. Um, so there sure are some, some big numbers that, uh, that make sense to, to executives with decision-making powers. Um, that's a good learning in itself internally. Um, so we can turn design and user experience into competitive advantage. It's not just a consumption of resource, it's actually a generator of, uh, of revenue and returns. Um, it's a product for the building of products. So now comes the interesting bit. We've created a design system on paper. We've designed it uh, from the ground up, um, but it's not real yet. It can't meet a user. Um, and this is where uh, we need our engineering colleagues um, to join the mission and to help us. Um, we have a dev framework called Carbon, and our mission has been to match our design system with our development framework. And that's where Will's the expert who can tell you a little bit more. Excellent. Thank you very much, Ben. I'll, I'll use this one time. Hold on tight. <laughs> Hold on tight. <laughs> uh, so, thanks very much, Ben, in terms of the journey we're on. Um, and I think it's really important that the, the two of us are here telling the story about the stage because it's, it's a journey that we've been on together. So, we've got specialists in our teams, but lots of specialists. But it's how we get those specialists to work together that actually delivers the outcome solves the problems. So Ben's talked um, fantastically about that QX piece, that design piece. I'm going to focus a little bit more on how we're doing that then, bringing this to life through the development frameworks we have to see. Um, just before we get off, I've got to talk to a, a few of you just before. Um, and in terms of just understanding in the room, do you consider yourself specialists of, of UX and design, or have you actually put some code Hands up if you've cut a code, the line of code in the last 20 years, what's it? So, oh, <laughs> right, excellent. So, I just want to talk about my journey in terms of just how this has been brought together. So, I've been with Sage for, for 20 years. Um, they don't allow me to leave the North East of England that often. Um, so, I've <laughs> been working for Sage for 20 years. And when, when I first started as an associate developer, um, design and how we put together the UI and the colours that we used, and I know design is far more than just that. It was the developers doing that, and we invariably got it wrong. <laughs> Quite a lot. <laughs> so, and in, you know, just in terms of one of the things I've learned over the last 20 years is actually working together with people who've got those specialisms and using everybody's skills to get the back best outcome. And you know, something you know, I, I learned as well is uh, I myself am slightly colorblind. Um, so if any of you in the room are uh, building designs and you want a blue button, I'm your man to give you a purple one. Um, <laughs> as lots of people have uh, talked to you over the years. So it's about how we work together and how we bring these things together. And that's what's really important for us at say. So what I'm going to talk to you uh, about is uh, the framework, the dev framework we call Carbon, which is part of the story about how we bring to life uh, and build um, experiences for customers uh, through the design language system um, and how we make that real. So when we kick this off, um, we looked around, um, we in the Sage Academy team are primarily uh, Ruby on Rails house. Um, and therefore, we were looking at something outside of the Rails ecosystem. Uh, a lot of you guys have talked to you today um, are using React. Uh, it's probably a mix of React and Angular, I guess. Um, so we looked at all of that and we thought, well, you know, React's got that. What we wanted is something where we could deliver a very loosely coupled solution. And by that, I don't mean, I mean, we don't want loads of dependencies. Uh, so we want something that people can pick up and, and use. So we went through um, a series of analysis and we, we settled on React. Um, we wanted that to be something that was 
fast, fast and flexible for people to learn. And we also wanted it to be, you know, current, something to engage our development teams, um, so that you know they keep up to date with the latest and greatest. Um, and, you know, we didn't want to be tied to something um, that was was part of our, our, our legacy or still incredibly valuable. So moving that there. Um, so in terms of carbon as a dev framework, one of the most shameless plugs I'll do, I'll do one, <laughs> is at Sage Carbon is open source. Uh, so if you have a GitHub account and or you have a UX designer and you have a UX team, go to carbon.sage.com and we'll have the links a little bit there. And you can actually go in and check that out and you can actually fill um, user designs, a user interface, in the same way that we're building uh, then Sage. So what do we get um, out of the box? Uh, so if you do visit common.sage.com, uh, we're also looking to make this an experience, it's fair to say, for our developers, uh, for our development teams. So we provide um, lots of um, helpers and tools so that people can get going really quickly. Some good examples on here, uh, where you can see you can sort of try and do a couple of things. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so you can see here some of the things we've got going, a real time preview of just changing some properties and uh, on some controls. So you can also see on the right hand side, it's giving you um, some of the example, we have code that you're going to need to build that. So really bringing that to life as an experience for the developer. Um, we've, we've said it lots in this, we want teams to work together. Uh, we want teams to all cross the line together. And where we can get to with what we're building with carbon, uh, and with the design team in terms of how they construct designs, we're blurring that piece so that actually some of the designs that we're getting are actually scaffolding uh, the, the parts that we need to actually take that forward through in the development. So you can see things like the sketch like it and the, the dev framework, some of the code that comes out of those designs actually ends up in the full implementation. And we'd love to take that even further to, to change that world. So, what's the lesson we want to take away from this? We want our teams to all speak the same language um, and cross the line together. Uh, and doing that with something like Corbin and the design language system, we marry those things up. Um, you know, we've talked about some big numbers on some of those screens, but where are we getting the productivity from to, to, to drive those gains as well? Well, from some of these small changes, marginal gains. Out of those big um, so, something we're really proud of uh, is that carbon is open source, and you know, if, if like I say, if it's the second shameless plug, <laughs> please go and check it out on carbon.sage.com. Um, it's, it, it, we've reduced all of the dependencies, so it's very lightweight um, in terms of how you can pick it up and get started. There is an additional repository uh, on GitHub called Carbon Factory, which should allow you to get the hell of the world uh, in less than five minutes, um, so that you can actually start constructing user, user interface through that. Um, it comes with all of the things that I mean, we've talked about, some technologies, but I'm sure everybody's going to be knowing them again, but the package management. Um, and also, part of this is we would love to build that community. So, the fact that it's open source means if, if you're looking to add um, uh, create a pull request, take a pull, <laughs> yes, please. Um, we, would love, we would love to see that as well, we'd be part of that journey, part of that. So, as Ben's told you, you know, Sage is a big organisation, 13,000 people who work at Sage, not all of them in Newcastle. Um, but we've got lots of teams, we've got lots of frameworks, um, we've got lots of um, things in production. Uh, so how do we manage that and how do we keep that moving forward? Well, part of it is that um, we settled on trying to get to one thing. 
So I guess if you're familiar with, if you want one thing, uh, you've got, sorry, you've got 10 things, and you want to get the one thing, all of a sudden you've got 11 things. Uh, but we're actively uh, driving that through and making sure that the things that we're building from uh, in new and the things that we're refactoring are taking this into account. It's not always possible straight off the bat because obviously there are some times we'll need to make some changes, but that's being embedded in our culture uh, all the way throughout the organization. Um, it doesn't just have to be things about carbon, because obviously there's a pragmatism that needs to be applied at certain times in the software development life cycle. Um, and through the design library system, what it means is existing teams who can't get that jump just at this point uh, can actually skin their UI so they can stop that journey to get in. So bringing that uh, all together. Um, the other piece that we're doing is currently theme management. So we're going to put a version of Carbon very soon, version 8. And you see that release on the schedule, which contains the, the theming support that you've just seen as part of the design out system. Now, part of that story is we have lots of teams using Carbon. And my inbox would fill up like you wouldn't believe if we broke everyone, if that makes sense. If we release something, uh, so obviously you need to consider that balance compatibility. And I guess it, the message for you guys is if, if you're using Carbon, as part of the development framework, there is also the organisation of Sage, which has to work to keep that balance on the platform. So you're looking at something that's evolving, but there's a lot of thought and effort goes into that. So what, what, have, we, uh, what have we learned from that? Uh, we need to build for the past, the present and the future. And what we're trying to do is bring those all together and keep those moving along. Uh, the design system and the common framework are the things we use uh, to drive that and bring that all back. Um, one other, is this a solution for the evening? <laughs> so, um, obviously, with lots of developers and people building software today. It's, it's it's part of this. Carbon's obviously open source. Um, we're also focusing on that developer experience, and hopefully you'll get a feel for that. If you do go and check out Carbon, the other place you go and check out as part of Sage is the developer experience that we've created at uh, developer.sage.com. Um, part of the reason we think that's really important is, and I'm sure you guys have gone to look at the new API or gone to look at the new framework or gone to look at something. If you can't get it started in five minutes, it's, it's fairly easy just to walk away. So we look at that from that perspective to be able to, for you to be able to get started, get set up, get going, uh, and actually the proof would probably be in you guys having to try and then uh, if you can't get going in five minutes, you should shout for us. Um, so a development ecosystem where we're exposing uh, our APIs. So we write a company software. We also write payroll software, so you find lots of the APIs in there. So if you're looking to build something, uh, you can build in tandem with Sage by leveraging all the, the you know the, the fantastic opportunities the customer base, but also you can build a solution that actually has beautiful themes uh, because you can build it using the same wide toolkit that we have. So what have we got that's coming up? Um, so first of all, we talk about the version we're going to cut uh, very soon with the help of several of the guys in the room. So thank you for that, guys. Um, it's been a fantastic journey we've been on um, since the start of January. Um, so part of that's bringing in the, the design language system and the theming that we talked about. Um, we've also done lots of small improvements, minor improvements, both in terms of developer productivity, but also in terms of uh, user feedback in terms of how the controls operate. Some really interesting or quirky things when we build these controls are for an accountant or for somebody who's just entering um, their invoices, they actually don't want to look at the screen. Sometimes they've just got a pile of invoices and they're rattling away with the keyboard. So that means our controls have to be um, super responsive to that. So if they're used to entering the date as four digits, we know that and we'll, we'll react in that way. Some, some people 
I have that mouse experience, and we need to cater for that as well. But it's those intricacies right down to that level in these components that has been built up over, over years of understanding customer problems in this space. Um, what are we also doing? We're we'll looking at improvements for accessibility, um, so based on the WCAG 2.1 standard. And we're also looking at things for responsiveness and uh, mobile. So those are all things that we're considering in terms of the, the COVID framework. Put those on the roadmap. You can see them if you go on the COVID at CHR.com and that's fourth. <laughs> uh, and please check out. So what's that lesson? So for the guys in the room who've been as part of software development projects and when's it done? When's it ever going to be done? You know the answer to when it's done is actually when you turn it off in the production. Because it's never done. It's always there. So please consider that, please understand that these things evolve, uh, these things grow, uh, and it's your skill and your dedication to your know, profession that makes that so. So just in terms of wrapping up, uh, what we've done is we've just um, left our details on here, so please if if you have any questions or you'd like to reach out, myself and Ben are available on CHR.com. Find something in over there. Um, and again, call me about CHR.com. Um, yeah. Good information. Yeah, there's a great resource on the uh, the left there as well. Um, so credit to our, our friends at Envision who have a, an incredible resource to, to help you get started, in which we found very useful, a design systems handbook, uh, which is at uh, designbetter.co. Um, there's a load of, of uh, great stuff there. Um, so it's definitely worth a look.